Um, again, my name is Shane Meyer. I am. This meeting's being recorded. Got it. Um, I'm from Northwest Ohio. Um, I've teamed up here with uh, Jay and Dave Brandt to kind of teach you guys uh, a little bit more uh, deep dive into the cover crops by families. And uh, this is all hosted through the Nature Conservancy, which uh, I was in a program with them called the Farmer Advocate Program. And it's uh, reach out to you all and uh, try and um, educate you a little bit more on some of the conservation practices that we can do as a farming community. Um, so Dave and Jay uh, put on an excellent presentation last week. If you were all here um, for us, welcome back. Um, if you're new, uh, welcome. And uh, we'll try and uh, have a question and answer process for all this, but Jay and Dave have set up a slideshow to talk a little more in depth um, of uh, on the subject and uh, I'll be posing questions as I think of them as they come up, up. Feel free to unmute if you have your own question and uh, or type it into the chat and myself or Brent will pose a question as it comes up when we, we find a second um, in their presentation. So uh, please ask many questions. I wanna learn as much as you guys wanna learn here. So uh, we'll, we'll push forward. Go ahead, Jay, Dave, whoever wants to go first. All right, we'll share our screen here and get started. Very good. Just to uh, introduce ourselves again, right? Uh, myself, Jay, and the father, David, here in Fairfield County, Central Ohio, just outside of Columbus. We've been uh, farming here for over 50 years and have been involved in conservation, no-till, and using cover crops the majority of that time. So a lot of experience. Uh, my father, David, has done a lot of consulting here with conservation practices and cover crops for several years. Uh, we have our own seed business, Walnut Creek Seeds, based on the farm. And uh, we service uh, the greater Ohio Valley region and we'll ship across uh, the nation. So a lot of availability there. So again, like Shane said, uh, we've got a small crowd so we can do a good Q&A type. Uh, feel free to jump in anytime with questions uh, and we can answer them as they come up. So again, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the cover crops uh, by type here, uh, different types of legumes specifically today. We'll get into estimating the nitrogen contribution from them. Uh, as we speak, uh, we'll try to capture some topics on planting and especially any issues, especially with termination. Yes. So here we have uh, a cover crop uh, chart uh, that goes from cool season to warm season, but we're mainly going to be concerned with legumes that's in the center of this chart. Uh, both cool and warm, uh, and we'll try to explain each one of those as we uh, present the pictures to you this, this evening. So we're gonna start out with clover species and talk about those. Those are probably the most widely used uh, and adapted to different regions. Uh, the top one on the chart, the medium red clover is historically been used quite a bit in farming practices, especially this time of year, which is optimal for frost seeding and establishment of medium red clover in either pastures, uh, hay fields, uh, and especially in wheat or small grain crops as a nitrogen, a natural nitrogen source and weed suppressor during your, your season. Clovers are all very small seeded, uh, so there's several seeds per pound. Some clovers are larger than others. Some are more readily available than others. In general, they're really good at uh, weed suppression, uh, fairly good at producing biomass, and uh, really good with, again, pollinators because of the blooms, right? Uh, ease of establishment is fairly good as we talked about for broadcasting and things of that nature. So a lot of functionality and uh, 
different opportunities here with clovers. So again, we'll start with the red clovers and then we talked a little bit about medium red clover and how it's very widely used. Yes, and uh, you know, uh, like Jay said, it was easy to establish. Uh, I, we, use, we don't use a whole lot of it in our mixes here on the farm, mainly because we look at other clovers that has the potential to be uh, more widely adaptable, maybe a little easier to uh, establish. And they tend to fix more nitrogen than red clover does. Uh, uh, you know, you need to have that plant out there long enough that it can uh, uh, actually form some nodulation on the roots from the nitrogen in the atmosphere. And uh, uh, the key thing is not to get them very deep in the soil early in the springs when you're trying to grow, uh, get started. So one of the issues that we've had with red clover is that it provides a very good um, habitat for mice and voles. Yes. So for planting corn after red clover, we have a significant problem with predation of the small plants, corn, you know, so we would have big holes in the field, <clears throat> mainly from the mice and voles getting through it. We prefer the crimson clover as the annual crimson as opposed to the red clover because red clover is more persistent and it can be from a no-till standpoint a little problematic to terminate with herbicide if you're not aggressive uh, with your herbicide package. Okay. Yeah and it won't you know red clover will not roll as nice as crimson does or some of the other plants that uh, clovers that have uh, uh, larger stems. Yep but again a very popular uh, cover crop or perennial crop used. Uh, Shane himself is probably going to get well experienced with uh, red clover in his organic operation uh, from that standpoint. It's just a very easy uh, lever to pull in that scenario for weed suppression and nitrogen contribution, uh, you know, when you're challenged with uh, end sources from that standpoint. Crimson clover is the other. So let me interrupt you there real quick. Sorry, I think I'm lagging just a little bit. Um, did, you did go over the fact that red clover itself will not crimp, correct? Correct. Correct. Yes. Medium red will not crimp. But if you're going to crimp a crimson clover that you need to wait for flowering? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, now... With the organic side of it, uh, not being able to use a herbicide, um, what is the best tillage method to terminate it? Can you get away with doing something other than a mobile plow? Well, I think you can get by with disking it maybe twice. Would be a good thing. Yeah, common practice would be a chisel followed by a disc seems to be in our conversation. So we really need to break those root systems up. Uh, the high speed disc uh, has potential as a one pass system, but you've really got it because it shears the soil a lot more, right? Than a finished disc would mm -hmm. and leaves a nice level uh, field for planting. So that's a good option, the new high speed discs for terminating the red clover. Okay, proceed, thank you. <laughs> so crimson clover from a red clover standpoint is probably our favorite clover to use. Uh, seed availability is very good. Price is very good for the contribution you get in nitrogen. Uh, it is widely adapted in our area south of I-80. We know that older crimson varieties had a difficult time establishing and overwintering north of I-80. Uh, we promote, as you can see by the tag, the a Kentucky Pride brand Crimson Clover, which is a, a selection of Crimson Clover that is very cold tolerant, uh, as well as slightly more tolerant to saturated soils. It doesn't, you know, Crimson does not like really wet places. Uh, it will not grow as well, and sometimes normally just plain dies because the roots are so waterlogged that... Uh, the, there's not enough oxygen in the ground to keep it going, you know. 
But as we mentioned before, Crimson Clover uh, does to terminate mechanically, you do need to wait till it's 100% in bloom. And then the stems are hollow and you can roll crimp to terminate. Crimson Clover is one of the earliest clovers to mature as well. So that's a nice thing for uh, early planting here in Ohio would be like early to mid April, depending on which cultivar you've got. So here's a table that I found uh, that compares, this is from the, the Lakeford Plant Material Center in California, some work they did back in 2016 to 2018. And these are different varieties of crimson clover that have been uh, historically around and some developed by ARS. Those are, that's uh, Auburn, AU is Auburn University, developed the Robin, Sunrise and Sun Up varieties. Um, I think the Sunrise and the Robin are the two varieties that you would find readily available. And then of course the Dixie and Kentucky Pride also very readily available. On the right side of the chart, you can see the estimated dry matter yield and how we see some significant differences in that between the cultivars, as well as the estimated nitrogen contribution. That, that contribution, remember, it is good to uh, only good for about about two two thirds to half will only be available the first year uh, in the soil for your plants. So don't don't think you can plant uh, Kentucky Pride and uh, find you got three hundred and seventy nine pound of nitrogen. You know. Also, along with this, as you're using these legumes, always keep in mind to use some kind of grass crop with it, like a cereal or some other grass so that we do not uh, get the carbon to nitrogen ratio so out of whack that uh, uh, the ground will get hard because, uh, uh, you know, I'm always a good guy to try things. And I thought, man, if I had 10 legumes in a, in a cover crop mix and we planted it one year and uh, we did have about 600 pounds of nitrogen in the soil, but uh, come springtime, that soil was like the concrete driveway. So we forgot about the carbon nitrogen ratio. So I learned a viable lesson real quick there. Yep. You know. Correct. So again, more tables on, this is about maturity or 50% bloom dates, again, from a similar study. Uh, and again, the reason we do like the, the Kentucky Pride, that's the top bar. It shows this delayed maturity compared to the other versions. One thing we do see then, is with this delayed maturity is that winter hardiness. The early maturity ones, this uh, the AU Sun Up, again, is a southern crimson clover where it doesn't experience uh, the cold extremes that we would have here in the Ohio Valley. Uh, so it's not going to have a, it's, well, it's not going to survive generally our winters very well. Uh, the Dixie, which is a historic crimson clover, also struggles above I-70 to overwinter. Uh, for a lot of conventional farmers. So generally, uh, as your soil health improves, we see uh, better survivability of the crimson clover. Uh, and the crimson clover is also somewhat sensitive to uh, residual broadleaf herbicides. So we've noticed uh, that again, that it may take one or two cycles in a cover crop sequence before we get very good establishment of crimson clover. Here's a picture of Rick Clark with his uh, 60 foot INJ roller crimper. Here he is uh, crimping a field of crimson clover and getting ready to plant corn. So again, uh, we see broad adapted uses of this. We've had customers using cultipackers to terminate crimson clover with success. And that experience generally is uh, at least three times. So you would plant the corn and then roll crimp probably three days in a row at different angles to try to crush as many stems as possible with the cultipacker, uh, the roll, you know, a designed uh, cover crop roller crimper is much more effective, be mainly because of either the straight bars or the chevron pattern that we see with the INJ crop roller. White clover is another popular clover, uh, very good nitrogen producer. Uh, the thing about white clover, it is a strong perennial clover, uh, can be uh, very difficult to terminate because it is tolerant to high traffic 
and tolerant to a lot of abuse from that standpoint, which is why it does well in pastures. Ladino types uh, are taller, more forage type clovers. Uh, Dutch white is what we see in our yards everywhere. Uh, that is a very small clover, a white clover, very popular again for uh, yards and walkways, high traffic areas. Not a large nitrogen producer though. Uh, uh, we see that, you know, generally we're looking at 25 to 30 pounds of nitrogen from these uh, two types of white clovers, you know, not a large nitrogen producer and not a large vigorous root system. Correct. As far as it goes depth, you know, a lot of fibrous roots, but no deep roots to speak of. Yep. So if you had really abused, uh, degraded soil that was uh, at the surface, uh, really sticky, uh, the white clover and actually all the clovers have that very fibrous, very shallow root systems that really build soil. So they build soil aggregates and increase that pore space and improve water infiltration and reduce erosion significantly. Other clovers that we see in forage systems or hay systems would include arrowleaf, which is a annual clover similar to crimson but it has a white spikelet bloom instead of a red one. Uh, Persian clover is another Southern clover, very popular in the South. Uh, Grassland Oregon, who is our primary supplier of clovers has developed a new version or a new uh, selection of Persian clover. Uh, that's very good for forage and much more cold tolerant than previous versions. Bursim is an, another annual clover. Uh, and again, there's improved varieties of this for higher productivity, and it matches alfalfa very well for feed quality. So if you have a thinning alfalfa stand, bursim is very good to fall seed uh, and get established and then really support uh, and finish out a year in your alfalfa stand uh, before you need to you know, rotate into a different uh, scenario there. Subclover, again, is another popular cover crop clover used in the south. Uh, again, the seeds are really kind of hard to get because it's called subclover because the seed heads bury themselves in the soil. Uh, so the, the availability of seed is poor, but it is fairly good producing and very good at erosion control in the southern type soils. Uh, Balanza clover, we like, I extremely like really well. It's a good forage. It's an excellent nitrogen fixer and it's very winter hardy. The things we found on our farm that I really was impressed with was that the balance of clover seems to stay where the soils are damper. Uh, we'll see a lot of balance of clover in our pockets where it would hold water, maybe they're 10 foot wide or 15 foot wide, a little bowl. Uh, and we'll find balance there, but then you won't find your crimson or your rye or that kind of stuff there because it was just too wet for it. So uh, it does have a center tap root. Uh, it puts lots of nodulation on. It gets fairly tall, as you can see in the picture. And uh, we can count on about 85 to 90 pounds of nitrogen from a balance of clover stand that looks like this, you know. So if we're looking to do things, you know, a couple, three different clovers blended together can really make your capture of nitrogen from the atmosphere uh, really beneficial to uh, your bottom line. So if we hey, look at, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, so back to the nitrogen fixation and stuff like that, as uh this topic grows bigger and bigger. People are looking to, you know, possibly interseed clover, um, like uh, we do with wheat. Uh, on the organic side, we're doing that into our wheat to get ready for our our corn, right? Is there any way to grow a clover crop and suppress it enough to keep it under the canopy to keep generating nitrogen throughout the year without termination? So we would, there's one clover we haven't talked about uh, that was be called uh, Aberlasting, which is kind of like a Cura clover crossbreed. Now that clover uses stolons, so it's a very well-established perennial. 
Uh, you could potentially look at using a strip till system. You know, that would definitely uh, put uh, the clover dormant in that strip until it reestablished uh, or use some very tight grazing or mowing uh, and then plant into that with that type of system. So Cura clover, this uh, aberlasting variety of uh, stolen based white clover, those would be two that you could use those techniques uh, as a method for rolling into corn and having a perennial clover crop. A lot of things we see, though, along that line chain is, you know, once you have that cover crop established and maybe you've only taken out the, a band with a herbicide, we'll just say that's not organic. So but if we were taking out a, a six inch band where the corn was going to grow, uh, it does fairly well till the corn gets to be between waist and knee high. And if they're running in high populations like 32 to 36 to 40,000, uh, the sunlight gets shut down this, to the ground and those clovers seem to not go dormant. They just plain die because lack of sunlight. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're lowering the population to 28 to 26,000, uh, you can keep those covers there and they do fairly well to supply the nitrogen that the corn crop would need, you know. Okay. Yep, definitely. So again, if you looked at the wider row configurations, you know, 36 to 42 or 60 inch corn, that then gives you, you know, a lot more sunlight in that corridor uh, that you can work with as well as, again, more than likely you're looking at running livestock in that as well. So you get you know a lot of benefit out of that perennial clover system in that scenario. And they, any of the small clovers, you know, something that's six or eight or ten inches tall seems to take the shade a lot better than clovers that gets uh, two and a half or three foot tall. Yep. You know, or any legume that gets that tall. Yep. Okay. Our, uh, yeah. Literature shows uh, the medium red clover, crimson clover. Uh, to be very persistent in the corn canopy uh, in, let's say, like that north of I-80 scenario where a lot of that interseeding is having more success. Gotcha. So just another table showing a nitrogen in the biomass, right, of uh, these different clovers. These are again are the Grassland Oregon branded uh, improved clover systems. Uh, they've done a lot of testing here at the University of Illinois and Ohio State to quantify uh, available nitrogen in the biomass system. So we would look at these and, and estimate, right, that they would contribute about half of this value to the next year's crop. And then subsequent years, you'd get more and more release from the residue. And this is just exactly what we was talking about by using two or three different clovers that's capture nitrogen in the atmosphere. So if you look at the balanza and the versine and the crimson, uh, you know, there's uh, 300 and some pound of nitrogen possibly that they can capture out of the atmosphere. So if we only captured half of that the first year, we've got enough nitrogen for about 150 bushel corn. So sweet clover is a biennial, which means that it doesn't produce fruit or seed in the first year. And there's a yellow seeded version and a white or flower version and a white flowered version. Uh, we commonly see this in uh, ditches uh, and road banks here in Ohio and in some places northern because it's uh, very winter hardy. Uh, it has this uh, pretty nice taproot for breaking up uh, tough soils. Uh, it's a good for beneficial insects. The honeybees love it and does pr uh, uh, produce a good bit of nitrogen. Yeah, and it really works great if you happen to have preventive planting where you have that window where you can get it in in May or June, June we'll say, after the cutoff date for corn and let it grow all summer, then let it come back up in the spring and then no-till because it takes that second year for those... Uh, for those, uh, for the plants to take in all that atmospheric nitrogen and make nodules. It don't make as much nodules the first year as it does the second. 
And we'll see that across the board in most clover species uh, that the fall establishment, you don't see a lot of um, nodules forming on the roots. Correct. And you primarily see that in the spring once they break dormancy and really uh, advance their growth. Medic and trefoil are also uh, useful in certain areas. They're more popular in the south and mostly used as a forage uh, legume, uh, but would be something to consider if you're, if you're rolling into a rotation for grazing. Yeah, trefoil is just really great to help rejuvenate old pastures that have holes in them. Uh, and also, it puts enough nitrogen in there that your grasses, your fescue, and your bluegrass and broom or whatever you got there uh, comes on a lot nicer in the spring after you've had some uh, trefoil in there. Yep. Other cool season legumes would be larger seeded. Uh, like peas, uh, vetch, and beans. Uh, so we see again by the seeds per pound count that these are much larger. Our seeding rates are relatively higher. Um, and for these items, again, similar in properties in regards to uh, aggressive growth gives us good weed suppression. They produce a good amount of biomass <clears throat> and are good for pollinators, especially uh, from that because these generally have very large blooms and are preferred by yep. foraging bees. And also these are these these legumes are the larger seeds so these seeds have to be or should be put in with a drill. You can spread them but it's likelihood only about 20 or 30 percent is going to grow uh, so the cost of those means that they should be incorporated a little bit either with a call to pack or mashing them in the soil or using a no-till drill uh, or a drill to get them in the ground. Yep, a lot of times in the fall, you could use a conventional drill if yes. the ground is soft, uh, because we're really only trying to get them in an inch or not Half quite inch. an inch, right? Half to three quarters of an inch is right. plenty uh, for these to get established. So some of these are fairly large, especially the, the lupin and fava bean yes. uh, are very large seeds. Peas, Austrian winter peas are probably one of our favorite go-to uh, cover crop varieties uh, because of the broad window that we see, especially after small grains for getting them established and because of the nitrogen contribution that we can get out of them. And here you can see by the picture, you can see the nodulation on the roots. Uh, uh, there's a nice set there about three or four inches down and you can see little uh, white nodules are there uh, all the way down through the root system. And uh, uh, it really has a pretty nice tap root. If you get it in after wheat, uh, most generally that root is the size of a uh, lead pencil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen nodules on uh, winter peas as big as your thumbnail. Definitely. Yep, so again, a great companion. Uh, it was kind of our break into uh, the multi-species cover crop when we had the split row planter, you know, planting a row of peas and a row of radish, you get that good sense of order. So your OCD is satisfied with the planting <laughs> on that. Uh, but again, the benefits, like you see, like we talked about before, having a companion plant in there to balance your carbon and nitrogen and to balance that uh, push and pull in regards to fertility uh, in the soil and being stored uh, is a good balance there. The other thing with Austrian winter peas is uh, particular varieties when planted in late October here in central Ohio up to around the I-80 corridor. If we plant between the 15th and 20th of October, we have a very good likelihood that the peas will overwinter and then continue to provide nitrogen in the spring. So Generally, if we're planting after wheat, the, the peas are pretty mature and they're going to winter kill just because of that maturity. But uh, the timing with growth development by planting in the second half of October gives us a good chance for overwintering. Uh, peas potentially can be roll crimped to terminate because they are a fairly succulent plant that uh, does get a hollow stem when it puts on the flower. Uh, but it is fairly indeterminate, so you run into the risk of areas of the field that are mature and areas that are not. So uh, yes. success is variable across the field in that sense. 
Harry Vetch is probably the most uh, well-known and widely used cover crop specifically for fertility enhancement with nitrogen. It is known to produce up to an excess of 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, especially when used as a green manure, and that is incorporated, right? Usually, so a lot of organic producers or our grandfathers would have yeah. used that in the past, right? Uh, so it is an excellent nitrogen fixer. Most varieties are fairly winter hardy, especially most of the most recent cultivars. Uh, most of the growth is in spring, especially if it is late seeded. Uh, if it's seeded after wheat, it can get pretty rank in the field and you run the risk of it suffocating itself over winter. So there's pluses and minuses yes. both ways. Can comment on that? No. Okay. Again, it's an excellent companion with cereals because it holds it up off the ground and kind of prevents that uh, suffocating in the fall. So here's a table showing different varieties of hairy vetch. Uh, the, the TNT variety is from our friends uh, at GS3 Seeds, that would be, uh, and uh, the, the CCS Groff has also been rebranded as the Winter King variety. Uh, purple Prosperity and Purple Bounty were developed by uh, USDA ARS. Uh, the purple bounty is more available because it is a better seed producer. It's very difficult to find the purple prosperity type. Generally, you're going to find mostly VNS, uh, primarily from a price standpoint, it's going to offer you the best value. So we just have to take care of the origin of seed. Uh, we're looking for Oregon or Russian origin. Those tend to have the best winter hardiness, but you'll see Seeds come from Argentina and Austria are also two other popular locations. And here again, on the right-hand side, we look at biomass yield and we can see that the different varieties can offer different biomass contribution. And then as well as the estimated total nitrogen, right, that we talk about, uh, but only that includes both organic and inorganic. And usually about half is the inorganic type, which would be more readily available in that cropping season. So here we see some of the different growth habits from those varieties. And so this chart kind of shows us the speed that it develops that biomass to help compete against weeds. So we see that the VNS and the Lana varieties really increase in biomass quickly we have seen those particular varieties are not particularly winter hardy. So that's where you balance in that speed of establishment versus winter hardiness with the hairy vetch. If it's in bloom, it's not too hard to terminate, but you need to make sure that you have at least 70 to 80% purple flowers. If it's a vetch, it has purple flowers. If it's a white flower vetch, it's even more you almost have to have it full bloom in a, with a white flower vetch. Right. So that would be more of a common vetch, vetch. with the white flowers. Right. A uh, hairy vetch typically will have those purple ones. And you're looking for minimum of five different bloom sets as it grows out. Uh, up to seven is better uh, from that standpoint. So we're looking for a minimum of five bloom sets before we know that the hairy vetch is ready to roll crimp and terminate. <clears throat> hairy vetch is now, also... Hey. No yeah, go uh let's just clarify the five bloom sets is that per plant ultimately yes. yes so you're looking when you pull up uh an individual plant you want to see five blooms in a row on that particular stem stem yep okay and it is somewhat indeterminate as well so that's why you need to check a couple times on that so Yep, and the other thing with hairy vetch is then hard seed, which we didn't talk much about <clears throat> in the clovers, uh, which clovers tend to have a little bit of hard seed, but hairy vetch, because of its, how big it grows, right? <laughs> it can pull, and so the idea that vetch is grown, if it gets in a wheat crop, the dark seed from vetch, if ground in flower, will discolor the flower and cause a problem, so you see rejects there, which is why Wheat growers don't typically care for hairy vetch. Uh, and that's the thing we have to look at there. Just be aware when you get your seed to look at the tag and see what the hard seed count is. Uh, and that would give you an indication of, you know, 
what kind of carryover in the seed bank you might have. And if you know you're a conventional farmer and growing wheat, and you've been using hairy vetch, you know uh, any broadleaf chemical will take it out. I, I often make the statement: if you have a can of two four D and the wind's blowing, set it on a fence post, and that'll pretty well take care of six or seven acres of it. Yeah. Just just the vapors of the two four D. It's very easy to kill, uh, and you don't need harsh chemicals to take it out. Nope. Not in conventional wheat. So if you've got a traditional uh, high <clears throat> high production wheat practice, right, that that program should take care of it pretty well. Yes, sir. How resilient is the seed, the hard seed, uh, if it, if it would go to seed and get inside your weed bank? It's pretty persistent because, yes. as you saw, it, it grows fairly long. It'll grow ten to fifteen feet long. And you'll have a bloom set every about 10 inches on there, which would produce two to three pods per bloom set. So uh, it can fill up your seed bank pretty quickly from that. So that's the, the big care that we have, <clears throat> especially in organic or a, a no herbicide system. Right. Uh, just some more data on that. In this case, we've got on the far right, this plant available nitrogen, which kind of takes in consideration the organic portion, which would not be as readily accessible as the inorganic to kind of give you a truer appreciation of, of that season nitrogen contribution. Uh, a little bit of comparison there, it's got common vetch and fava bean uh, in there as well. So you can see some of the differences that you get from that standpoint, as well as uh, the column with winter survivability. And you can see that the different varieties have that different uh, relationship there. So here we have a picture of uh, a popular way to manage the hairy vetch with the front mounted roll crimper uh, and the rear mounted corn planter. So dad and I looked at this picture and we thought that maybe there wasn't enough hairy vetch there for the roll crimper to terminate very well. Uh, but again, it depends on maturity. If this has, you know, the five plus seven or up to seven blooms, we have a good chance. But more than likely, this farmer is going to want to come back in two or three days and hit this field again before the corn gets up too high. If you roll twice with hairy vetch, normally you can control it pretty well. You know, it just seems like uh, the vetch seems to be, if you can roll it twice, we have a little better success with terminating if you're not using a herbicide. Yep. Now, can they uh, run the same pattern or do they need to go on a different angle? I don't think it makes much difference, just so you crimp it twice. And in corn, you don't want to try to, you want to try to minimize driving over the rows as much as possible. Right. right? So, <laughs> Which is where the question Usually staying on the same from. path is the best. Yep. yep. <laughs> so other vetches uh, that you find, a uh, woolly pod, which would be a common type vetch, uh, and crown vetch kind of fits in that category as well. Crown vetch is, uh, in most places categorized as a noxious weed. So we don't recommend buying it because its seed persistence is even worse than the hairy vetch. It is excellent at stabilizing ground, which is why it gets seeded in the ditch banks, uh, but not really recommended in a cropping situation. No. Uh, Cahaba vetch is a popular white flowered vetch. Again, uh, would winter kill if seeded in the fall. Uh, but could be used as uh, frost seed or early spring seeded for late planted yes. crops. Chickling vetch is a very unique vetch, also commonly called grass pea because it's more like a pea actually in, in how it generates seed. And the seeds actually look like fine gravel because they're, they're square and rather what we call orthorhombic shape. And hard. Very hard. And hard. The thing about chickling vetch, uh, it works well, I think, in the spring mm -hmm. because within about 35 or 40 days after you plant, it wants to bloom. So it works real well where you're coming in early to plant some corn. Uh, the problem we see with it is when we put it in a multiple species blend that it blooms and makes a tremendous amount of seed before it'll frost off in the fall. 
So uh, we don't use much chickling vetch in too much of our cover crops going in in July and August, you know. Right, so that would be in a later seeded mix. Again, because of the short maturity, it pairs well with buckwheat in that sense for early flowering uh, and is a good companion there, again, for fixing uh, degraded soils where you've got a short rest period in rotation. Mm -hmm. So it will not uh, roll crimp very well because it has more of a, a pea structure and does not get a hollow stem when it goes reproductive. So it's not a good candidate for roll crimping. But uh, flail mowing when you have pod set would terminate again because yes. it's on the downward senescence anyway. Right. Lentils are more of a Northern Plains type legume. Uh, it is a smaller plant, uh, slow to establish, so it's not really good as a single species for uh, weed suppression, but is a decent uh, companion in lower seed rate mixes uh, from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Lupins have uh, been used as a cover crop for nitrogen production for, gosh, centuries. Uh, it is fairly, uh, it's not cold tolerant in that it survives the winter, but it's cold tolerant in that you seed it into frost. <clears throat> and it is later maturing. So it was typically used in front of cotton in the southern areas uh, where it was well known as a, a primary nitrogen source for many co uh, cotton crops uh, before, you know, the, the Industrial Revolution. And the lentil is really pretty in the field, as you can see, they're purple and they're white. Uh, you know, uh, if you happen to like to have some kind of arrangements, it makes really nice arrangements for flowers. Uh, but uh, a little bit, I think, to me, it's a little harder to establish than any other legume that we use, you know. It's a fairly large seed size and very it's shaped like a button, yeah. actually. So it can be difficult uh, to manage with in a mix because of the seed size and, and adjusting your seed cup appropriately. Right. Faba so bean, yeah, go ahead. We, we've got a question. Um, it comes in, uh, I know soybeans make their own nitrogen, but have you done any research in adding any type of legumes at low rates to help complement the cereal, cereal rye in front of beans? So we have uh, accidentally seeded lots of clover with rye <laughs> uh, and really not seen any detriment. Uh, we are always afraid of making lazy beans if there's too much nitrogen. <clears throat> but the key thing we mentioned here is that you plant it in companion with that grass crop. Right. And that keeps the, the nitrogen captured then in the grass. And so as it releases, uh, you're not uh, making the soybeans lazy. Uh, they have to still work to get that nutrient. So I think that the combination of crimson clover or red clover with a small grain, be it rye, wheat, uh, barley in front of soybeans is a good option, uh, especially as it would help fill in that understory and improve weed suppression. Now, can you use that at a low enough rate to be economical? Certainly, yes. yeah. Yeah, one half to uh, two pounds per acre. Maker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, that's less economically feasible this year because clovers have doubled in price, but uh, <coughs> everything's possible. Your fava bean, it's a, it's a wonderful plant to look at. Uh, it's awful hard to get it through a drill. <laughs> it has... Uh, uh, the seed size is probably like your big thumbnail. I mean, it's big. It's uh, uh, it has pretty good tap root. Uh, when it does bloom, it brings a lot of beneficial insects with it, and it can capture a fair amount of nitrogen. Uh, it needs to be planted in the spring, and usually don't grow very rapidly in the spring because it's such a big seed that by the time you want to plant corn, it's only three or four inches tall. You know. Yep, we've done uh, splitter planter planting with the, the radish. Uh, and this, like we say, it matures quickly. <clears throat> so within 45 days, it's bloomed and it's on its way down. 
So we get we had a lot of weed escapes uh, because of that in that scenario. So that's again, availability of fava bean here in the Ohio Valley is minimal. Uh, and as Dad mentioned, there's there's two different types of fava bean. There's the large seeded ones, yeah. uh, the desis, the desis, and then there's smaller seeded ones that go under a different name. And the smaller seeded ones tend to be preferred by the food people, which is why we get the big ones in, in cover crop. <laughs> So then we get to go to the, the warm season legumes. Uh, and there's quite a, a plethora or a broad spectrum of warm season legumes that you can look at. Uh, not too many really that are adapted for our area here in uh, the Ohio Valley. And we'll kind of go through that. So we see that we have a broad range in seed size uh, because this includes alfalfa and lespedeza, which are very small. And then you get up to the lab lab beans or chickpeas uh, which are rather large. Soybeans, again, are, are we used for years as a double crop slash cover crop. <laughs> uh, excellent nitrogen fixers, uh, can be used for forage. They take the heat, but they do need water uh, to get the best performance out of them. And we really don't, I really don't like to suggest you use soybeans in your cover crop mix, uh, unless you're not growing them as a crop to sell. Uh, you know, I think any time we can take a different root species and put it in the soil, we're much better off than just always using wheat as a cover or something you're growing. You know, I think we need to have that diversity <coughs> yep. in that. Uh, so I do not suggest using soybeans as a cover crop if you're growing beans as a cash crop. Yep. There's and, enough and of them come out of the back of the combine anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep, the one <coughs> exception might be if you're grazing because they right. do add a good bit of uh, forage value in grazing. Cowpeas are a southern legume, a very similar uh, in appearance to green beans out of your garden. Uh, they more are like green beans. Uh, they, they don't require a lot of moisture. Uh, they're a very good nitrogen fixer, a very quick growth, which means they're very good at weed suppression. And they're in, in, insect friendly because they have uh, inter, they have these nectaries on their uh, leaf petioles that feed uh, different insects. Uh, so, and they traditionally have been used in uh, vegetable production as a quick in between cover crop. Oh, yes. uh, generally, then would be incorporated, right, to add that fertility back really quickly. Nice thing about cowpeas are if it's a uh... Uh, if you're in an area with low rainfall and lots of heat, mm -hmm. they do extremely well. They do not like wet soils. They do not like cool climate. So in other words, if we're sitting in the areas of 80 or less degree days during the summer, they will not grow very well. So they like that 100 degree and they like uh, just a little bit of dew about every other week or something and they'll do really well. And variety performance with cowpeas is real important. Traditionally in cover crops, we're going to use what we call iron and clay or red ripper would be the two brand names that we would look for. Uh, recently, uh, there have been other ones like uh, China clay or some other ones uh, that are more based out of food production. So these are ones that would have uh, not met food grade and they will make good cover crop but they're going to be a more bush type cowpea as opposed to a viney type cowpea that we see with the iron and clay and the red rippers. Lab Lab is very similar to cowpea. It's just a bigger version. It has a, a larger branching tap root and does better in sandy soils and is very popular in Arkansas and Texas, Oklahoma area where it's more broadly used. Mung beans would be the small cousin to uh, cowpeas and lab lab, uh, also sometimes called uh, green gram. It is a food type bean uh, used quite broadly in, for making different types of uh, food products. Uh, so generally what we get in uh, the cover crop industry, again, are those things that don't make food grade. Uh, again, uh, takes the heat pretty good, does not require high fertility soils. It's good in mixes and does provide a good amount of nitrogen 
uh, contribution in your mix. And a little more expensive than cowpeas, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Just because the seed's not as widely available. Right. Sun hemp. Well, sun hemp. I really like this plant. Uh, if it's 80, 85 and higher, uh, it's a tropical plant. Uh, uh, it grows really well. Here in Ohio, we get about six foot tall. Sometimes it will bloom depending on the heat. Uh, it's really a good forage. Uh, we see our deer in there a lot, you know. Uh, we don't have cows, so we see the deer in there a lot. Uh, and it's really a great nitrogen fixer, but the thing it has, it really has a tremendous tap root. And uh, it doesn't have, uh, it has some fine hair roots, but not as many as some of the other legumes that we look at. And I really like to utilize it as our warm season legume in our mixes, just because we don't know what mother nature is gonna throw at us during the growing season in the summer. For sure, and that's again the, the amount of heat that you get. Generally, we would plant this after <clears throat> small grain, which would be wheat or rye. So planted late July, early August. And if it's cool summer, we've had it not get over three or four foot tall, where when we have those really hot dog days in autumn, we can get it up to six, eight, 10 inches or 10 feet tall. So it's, it's a fairly aggressive plant. It's a good companion especially if you're going for forage with other grasses like sorghum sedan grass. Chickpea and guar are more uh, adaptive to the plains area. We don't see them very much here in uh, the Ohio Valley, like we said before. Uh, benefits again are this taproot and uh, insectaries that are in there. They do tolerate higher temperatures. Uh, from that standpoint. So in their environment, in the plains, they tend to be very good nitrogen fixers as well. Again, seed availability and pricing is going to be more expensive, uh, but at, you know, a uh, low seeding rate could offer some advantage for diversity. Yes, correct. Sanfuane is primarily a forage legume used in the northern plains. Uh, not something that's very popular here, uh, again, because of the cost and seed availability. Alfalfa and Lespedeza, again, are, are those warm season crops uh, that we can put in to aid for forage production uh, and soil uh, building specifically, but common plants. These last two are more of a, a annual bush, <laughs> pigeon <laughs> peas and partridge peas. Fairly similar in stature and very woody stems, uh, primarily used for wildlife and attracting pollinators and rebuilding uh, soils, uh, like if you took a land scraper and level it uh, type abuse soil right. structure. More, so, more, much more expensive. Uh, you get a lot of money in these two uh, legumes. Uh, very pretty in the field. Uh, I think they're hard to establish. I don't know whether it's just because the seed is so hard and so big, but uh, we've, we can get it done, but uh, I've never been real satisfied with the stands we've had from them. Right, and again, because of the high carbon na nature to the woody stems, <clears throat> uh, they do have a very long lasting residue and uh, not as uh, easy to manage as the more succulent stems of the other legumes. So the big question, right? We've talked a little bit about how much nitrogen can we get out of uh, our single species or out of mixtures that we're doing. The consideration again is how much above ground biomass do we have? We estimate that the root structure is gonna be fairly equal or greater than the above ground biomass. But the big attractor is that around the roots are all the microorganisms that really actually contribute more to fertility than the plant biomass itself. So here is a standard report that we, you know, you do a search in literature and you find that at these monoculture seeding rates, you can achieve these types of pounds per acre available nitrogen with the different legumes. Uh, so we do definitely like uh, hairy vetch again, and Cahaba vetch can produce upwards of 200 pounds of nitrogen. Again, soybeans, uh, they purport to produce 400 pounds or better in the growing season. But in general, you're looking at around that 100, 150 pounds of nitrogen produced 
where are we would anticipate maybe 50% available in that year, especially in a no-till situation where you're relying on decomposition on the surface. And these, these amounts of nitrogen here is figured at bloom stage, not before they start making a seed pod, because as a legume, it doesn't matter what legume we're talking about, as the legume tends to make seed, it moves that uh, nitrogen or that nodulation nitrogen from the plant to make the seed. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to be real careful on when and how you plant these legumes so that they don't go to maturity, that we allow the frost to kill them. Now maybe one pea pod or, or one uh, pod on a, uh, uh, another uh, uh, forage pea would be okay, but we don't want the whole plant loaded up like you would a soybean for harvest, you know. Yep. So if you get it right at flowering, this is when we can see the maximum amount of nitrogen that that plant's going to produce uh, or store in the soil for release during the season. Yep. We have a so question okay. that came. Oh, yeah, sorry, we have a question that came through the chat. <clears throat> um, so. He says, you talk about available nitrogen from legumes uh, increasing over the years as cover crops are grown. Are legumes needed in the cover crop mix each year to see this increase in availability? Yes. At, ex at exceeding rates, right? So we know that adding <clears throat> carbon also or, or organic matter will improve, right? Yes, right. So again, uh, if you're like, if we're going to soybeans, and we want to control broad leaves and soybeans, we want to hold that fertility in the small grain that's going to go as a cover crop in front of the soybeans. So there is a balance with that. Primarily as a, a regenerative or soil health perspective, we're mainly looking to keep live roots in the soil and build organic matter, right, to improve those properties. Doesn't have to be legumes every year, Legumes do offer that advantage of diversity. Right. One thing we have to watch, though, that we haven't talked much about is that most of these legumes are uh, a host to nematode. So if we have a severe nematode problem, we have to be careful about clover selection. Sun hemp is the one unique, different one where it actually is uh, an antigen to nematodes because it's such a poor host that it will reduce nematode populations. Right, and that's why you always put a reddish with a legume. Yep. Because the reddish will actually fight some of those nematodes or it gives off a- uh, The glucosides. A glucosides, yeah, that's a big word for David. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, whatever that gives off, it actually helps suppress the, the, the bad nematodes that work on soybeans and that kind of stuff. So is it, is it good? Yes. Is it necessary every year? It depends on your rotation, right? There'll be years, you know, like you'll have soybeans in the field. So you really don't need a legume in the field that year. You yeah. know, uh, you'll have corn in the field, which is a grass. Uh, you may have a, uh, a, a clover in front of the, the corn, but uh, it's very unlikely you would have uh, legumes growing with the corn. Uh, most commonly. Most commonly, right. <laughs> As we learn more, we hope to be able to do that and have some legumes with the corn to pick up the nitrogen from the atmosphere to help the corn, you know, as we learn more, for sure. So again, we got started with the calculation how we could look at our own cover crop and determine what we might have. So this calculation is taken out of the SARE publication of uh, raising cover crops profitably. Uh, so again, we're looking at the weight of our dry sample that we take out of the, uh, our, our plot divided by the square feet sampled. Uh, and you could also estimate based on uh, assuming that it's only about 30% moisture, you know, or 30% dry matter when you harvest it. Yes. Generally speaking, most, yeah. most uh, green plants are only 30% solid. So you can estimate your biomass that way. And so the calculation is your biomass times the nitrogen contribution. We generally say more succulent legumes like peas and clover are around 3% nitrogen, where more woody legumes like your warm seasons are gonna only be about 2% and grasses even lower about one and a half. 
and in the uh, growth stages, not in the reproductive stage. Correct. All right. So using those calculations, uh, we also say that any plant that's around six inches tall will give us about 2,000 pounds per acre. For every extra inch of growth, we add 150 pounds of dry biomass. So we take the assumption for an 18 inch tall cover crop that has 60% ground cover, because we have to include that. We find we've got 1800 pounds of biomass uh, of the additional growth. So 2000 plus 1800 is 38. We multiply that by 60% to get to 2280 and times the 3% gives us about 68 and a half pounds of, a bit of nitrogen. Assuming then that half of that would be plant available. So all those are things that we would say. Rough numbers, yes. So you would think, yeah, so now I could take 30 pounds of 28 or chili and nitrate out of actual N out of my crop fertility plan. And this year, that's great because it's a buck a pound. So that's a $30 savings an acre. There you go. So that more than usually more than pays for the cover crop that you plant. Yep. So again, there's other nutrient values that come from cover crops, right? P, K. Uh, in this scenario, we're seeing that uh, generally the legumes carry larger values in additional phosphorus and potassium compared to other species like radish or oats. Radish, we know, is a good storehouse of potassium, especially, so not always a fair comparison. Here's another example. This table is fairly busy, my apologies, but again, we're looking at in different soil types in rotation to corn and sorghum, which we would be most familiar with, using hairy vetch in combinations with uh, oats or rye, uh, we can see that we have contribution of as much as 150 pounds of nitrogen in that. Uh, we do have to care for that C to N ratio. Uh, as we get here, the example of rye around 57, that's going to delay any nutrient release just because of nutrient tie-up from that standpoint. So that's a, a good equivalency. And the final column would say, if I was to purchase nitrogen, what would that equivalency be? And that's where we see this relationship of maybe about 50% or so of the, the pounds per acre reported as plant available. Again, as a comparison of different crops. In this one, looking at this, these crops were actually incorporated as green manure. And then the soil measured after these, these different number of days, right? Three, seven, 10, 14, and 21 days to look at the amount of available ammonium in the far right corner. If we're looking at nitrogen contribution going to corn, we can see that as let's say the alfalfa or the vetch or the clover, you see that available ammonium, which is your plant available nitrogen, right, increase with that decomposition of the crop. So this is where we say even in a no-till scenario where we have the residue on top, we're looking at every rain event being a type of compost T application as that rainwater goes through the, uh, the mulch into yes. the soil. Mm -hmm. So there's some additional online resources where we got the information from, primarily out of uh, the, the plants.usda.gov site, a great resource to look up individual species. Uh, and as we have highlighted here, issues with cover crops and the fact sheets for the plant guides to get more specifics about planting and management of those crops. SARE has that great resource, uh, which we talked about in our last discussion, the uh, Managing Cover Crops Profitably, which is a uh, PDF download for free that you can get, as well as the ability to purchase that uh, off the, if you wanted a hardbound version, right? Yes. Uh, the Midwest Cover Crops Council has developed and improved this tool, this uh, cover crop decision tool, uh, where you can get down to your county level in the state here of Ohio, where uh, we selected uh, cover crops as a nitrogen source for quick growth and building soil. And then it gives you a good list on there and shows uh, the dates for planting and maturity. Uh, excellent resource here with uh, the Midwest Cover Crops Council on doing research on these different cover crops. So we talked a little bit uh, about that in regards to many aspects of legumes. We, since we don't have livestock and not a lot of manure, our regenerative practice is to use a very diverse 
cover crop after small grains, which is at minimum 50%, usually 60 to 70% legume in the blend, both a combination of warm season and cool season legumes to maximize that contribution and diversity. They've been very successful for us. Uh, and again, uh, we recommend that practice across the board in different types of crop production. And the reason we do that when we put our grass species with it, they seem to accumulate the nitrogen in the root system from the legumes and then they actually feed that legume nitrogen to the grasses or the broad leaves that we put in there. And it seems like our cover crops get bigger and more lush than when we're not, when we're doing, when we're not using a legume in that mix. That's right. So it's made it real beneficial for us to have those three or four species of legumes with our grasses and broad leaves in our mix. Yep. And one last topic we didn't talk about yet was about the inoculant, right? So for legumes to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the nodules, they need to be <clears throat> uh, have the correct rhizobia so, bacteria that on the roots that would do that. So uh, generally, uh, inoculant is not that expensive, you know, from cents per acre to a pound or so, depending on the type of mixture you get. Each legume will have a different rhizobia. So it's very important to know that you have the proper rhizobia selected. So you can't use soybean inoculant with clovers. Uh, you can't use clover inoculant with peas or vetch. So it's very important from your vendor that you confirm that you get the proper rhizobia inoculant for your legumes. We use a multi-species uh, inoculant, our Micronoc inoculant, not only has 30 plus different rhizobia species, but as well as azobacter, beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae. Uh, so it offers multiple benefits there, but there are several branded different types of inoculants and all of them can contribute providing you selected the proper uh, inoculant for your legume. Remember with the inoculant, when you get it from the, your, your de dealer, that don't put it on the windshield of your truck or throw it in the bed of the truck with the other stuff. Try to keep it in where it's a little cooler, some shade on it till you wanna use it. And most of the inoculants are only good for 24 to 36 hours. Uh, outside the, of the bag. Outside of that bag. So just remember that as you're mixing it up, but, uh, uh, it is a possibility that it could uh, expire expire before you get it out of the drill. Especially if it rains a day or two. Or three or four. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? So how well do you need to mix that onto your seed? Can you pour it over the top, grab a broomstick and be good? Or should you really toss it around in a five gallon bucket? Now, our experience is, is that we generally top dress the, the drill box. Uh, we do commonly stir it in a couple of little bit of inches, primarily just to break up the clumps. But uh, we, we, we do offer the uh, option to coat the seed uh, when we package it. I uh, don't know that that's necessarily uh, important. Uh, it's just a point of ease where you don't have to add it in the field for that. So I I don't know if it's, going, it's, it's also going to depend on what kind of inoculants you get, because some inoculants have that one special a bacteria for just like say alfalfa, and it says there you must dampen it a little bit to get it to stick to the seed. Mm -hmm. That's the reason we like the one we're using. It's uh, it's very easy to establish in a box, and it seems to flow well, and it's actually inoculating the soil and really not inoculating the seed. You know. So we have another question in the chat. <clears throat> um, would an interseeded clover be negative to yield in an early planted sweet corn uh, north of I-90? Uh, the plan is to follow with field corn. We don't have, we generally don't practice that ourselves, but based on university studies that we've seen, it would not be a, a negative influencer on yield. Generally, the report is that it's uh, neither positive nor negative, uh, especially in a sweet corn scenario where it's a shorter season corn from that standpoint. I'd say most of the benefits have come more from grasses and brassicas 
uh, interseeded where we see yield increases, which is somewhat confusing. And I think it's very difficult to, to, to say that uh, it's hard to get two plants to grow together, especially like when you're trying to get sweet corn or corn even, the field corn, uh, you know, if that grass and or clover legume is established and you're trying to plant into it and you don't take care of it, it will outcompete that seedling crop that you're planting, you know. So you either ought to do the, uh, the uh, cover crop clovers three to seven days after you plant the corn uh, to give that a corn a, a, plant, a plant to sprout and come up just a little bit. Uh, because corn's a lot slower growing than some of these legumes are. So can you elaborate a little bit on actually how long it takes for clover to nodulate a fair amount of nitrogen? Um, because that process, I think, is a little bit longer than kind of what we're thinking at this, in this question or, you know, at the stage of interceding it into a crop. Right, and we mentioned that briefly before where we said uh, clovers traditionally fall planted uh, are not heavy nitrogen producers that season. It's in the spring once they break dormancy. And that's the challenge and I think why we probably don't see a lot of yield contribution for early interseeded legumes in corn. So, um, well, I think I think your larger seeded legumes like peas and stuff tend to set nodulation much more quicker than uh, the clovers and the alfalfa or the smaller seeded things. Uh, we've seen nodulation on peas within uh, three to four weeks after planting, mm -hmm. or it may be as much as eight weeks after planting before you'll see any forms of nodulation on clovers or alfalfas, you know. Any other questions? My mind's not working, so I can't play <laughs> that advocate very well. It looks like we have uh, Cindy seems to be one of the last ones left here. Any, anything on your mind, Cindy? Oh, there's quite a few of them still on there. Are they good? Okay, they're not showing up in our window. Yep, nothing else coming through the chat either. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, what's the name of the inoculant that you're using? Just came through the chat. Right, so our inoculant is a brand called the Micronoc. So Micronoc is a multi-species type that I described earlier, so yep. A little bit more expensive than some of the others but we feel it's well worth the money and that's why we keep promoting it with our customers that buy cover crop seed from us. That's great. Well, it uh, doesn't look like anything else is coming through the chat. Oh, here we go. Just kidding. Uh, so we got one that just came in trying to go grow clover ahead of next year's corn. Um, not much, not much success after harvest of sweet corn. How are you applying that? Uh, Larry, you want to come off mute if you don't mind? Um, I was putting it in a multi-species mix that was being air drilled right after harvest. And I've got a the very first planting of sweet corn in the southern part of Minnesota, usually getting seeded the first week of August. A little bit of clover may show up the next spring, but uh, not much. Uh, usually the everything else comes pretty well, but not much success with the clovers. Mm. Mm. I do that. Well, uh, how deep are they planting, Larry? Uh, we're only going in about three quarters to an inch, depending on what else is in the mix. Yeah, that could be a little too deep for the clovers. 
uh, on that. And do you have any, is it a herbicide program? Uh, usually what I'm doing for herbicide on the sweet corn is uh, three ounces of lotus and a quarter pound of atrazine. And with our rainfall, normally everything's fizzled out by the time we get to seeding the covers with that mix. Uh, this year was a different story though. We were pretty droughty and I think we had some residual because the grasses in the mix emerged, stalled, some of them died out and the brassicas took over. Yep, yeah. Yep. 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 Normally with uh, sweet corn guys, it's using bicep that we have problems with clovers especially, so. All right. right. Yeah, I've had real good success with the blends I've used. Then I come in and no-till field corn the next year right into the winter killed cover is what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. sure. Yep. Right. It's a good plan. Good plan. So just looking for a way to uh, get some nitrogen out there ahead of the corn, kind of bump the legumes up and see what I can do. Are you, are you using any larger seeded legumes like peas or anything like that? I have not so far. I, I would suggest been... you try some peas and see uh, whether that would work for you, you know? Yeah, my, my other uh, option I was toying with was uh, following a couple guys that are doing some bio strips with the faba beans. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Coming into my, my mulsy species mix with the air drill, then coming back with my corn planter and seeding in the faba beans and trying to plant right over the faba beans. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep. Right. Yes, sir. So no, I was just uh, toying with the idea of experimenting with clovers in the sweet corn interseeded. Uh, I don't know if the canning company would appreciate that, but just to see if I can get some growth ahead of the interseeding mix later, or I mean my multi-species mix later. So. So it, it does kind of sound like your depth could be hindering your clover. So I think sure. that's where that's where Dave was uh, trying to get you to use a, a P uh, that can take a little more depth and has a pretty good uh, ratio of nitrogen like the clover. They're, they're pretty equal. Okay. Am I wrong there, Jay? Nope. Nope. That's the whole concept there, right? So especially looking at having a winter kill. Uh, right. I think the, the peas would contribute much more nitrogen than the clover would in, in your latitude. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, any more questions for uh, Jay and David or Shane? Um, I will post the link to the registration again. Uh, looks like the next meeting will be on March 24th. Does that sound correct? Yes. Okay, yep. good deal. Um, and that will be over Brasco's. Um, so I'll hit stop recording now, unless uh, Jay, David, Shane, do you have anything to add before we end? Nope, thanks for everybody Thank for uh, being here and participating. Thank you. I appreciate you all showing up again here. I uh, hope to see you a month from now, and uh, we'll dive deep into the brassicas and uh, answer any questions. So feel free. Uh, I will add my email here real quick. Um, feel free to send any questions you may have prior to, and we can try and add that, um, add that into the slideshow or address it prior to. So. If you have anything you. else there, Jay or Dave. Not right at this time. Thank you very much.